Within 24 hours of the outbreak of war two years ago, New Zealand's coastal defence stations were manned and ready. All coastal areas since then have been kept under constant watch with guns like these waiting to fire at the slightest hint of suspicious action. The first shot of the war in the British Empire was fired by this battery, now beginning a practice shoot. Two or three miles offshore, a small craft tows the target. The battery has a reputation for good shooting and fast shooting, but the towing line is paid out until a wide gap separates the little ship from the target of those big guns on the headland. There's the target, small, hardly visible, and a very long way from the gunners, but no place for sunbathing today. Ready for the first shot. A big splash, but it missed. The Navy's not impressed. We'll soon put that right. Ready for another shot and make sure of the range this time. On the target and just watch those guns. Massey College provides temporary quarters for a new military staff college opened by the Prime Minister. With him are the Ministers of Defence and Major General Paddock, our new GOC. New training developments like this are good beginnings to his term here after his work with the New Zealanders overseas. Here at Massey College, the farming front and the fighting forces are literally working side by side. Trentham. More than 2,000 men march past as the Governor-General, Sir Cyril Newell, takes the salute. These men are part of the steady flow of New Zealand's manpower. The Governor-General says he likes the way they're shaping for the job. After the review, he inspects equipment and training. Machine gun crews in action, transport units, engineers and artillery all show that New Zealand can say, give us the tools and we will do the job. The men of this generation already know what flesh and blood alone have achieved against the German war machine, all out to prove that they too measure up and doubly encouraged by the gathering weight of metal and machines behind them, they're ready to show that democracy has the answer. From Trentham we go to Waiuru. New Zealand's army is adding to its punch with more and heavier machines of war and a special school established at Waiuru for training our own armoured corps. Parading before the Governor-General, Valentine tanks demonstrate their abilities. If uninvited guests ever do come to New Zealand, it won't be a tea party that meets them. Overcoming obstacles is the special job of these 15 tonners. Trees, barbed wire or ditches all come the same to the weight and power of the Valentine. We have the men and now the machines. We can take it and we can give it. Into the dawn over many strange and foreign seas has thrust the bar of the HMNZS Leander since last she saw home waters. Slowly now, but not wearily, she draws into the wharf at an unnamed port on an unnamed day. From hot suns to the cool New Zealand sky, from burning tropic seas to harbour at home. It will not be for long, but the welcome they get will last them for another long and hazardous journey. The Governor-General, Sir Cyril Newell, comes aboard to see with his own eyes what the people at home already know, that all is well with Leander and Leander's crew. When he had inspected the Marines and the ship's seamen complement, he told them we were glad to see them safe and they cheered him and New Zealand. They are honoured not only in their own country, for their work and the work of sister ships, they have earned for our naval forces the title of the Royal New Zealand Navy. The acting Prime Minister also spoke to them, the Honourable Mr. Nash. I welcome you home on behalf of the government and wish you and your families every possible good thing during the coming months. <laughs>
but we no sooner wished them good cheer than it was time to return for the farewell. Unheralded they came and speedily departed. On the ship to sing them out to sea before they left were Maori maidens. The visit may have to last them more long months, so they uh, make the most of their time. It's goodbye again, good luck again, and good hunting. No longer need the wounded of the second NZDF wait for transport back to a base. Close to the front line travels this mobile surgical unit, a hospital on wheels. Thanks to a gift of 2,500 pounds by Arthur Sims, once of Christchurch, it is fitted with the most modern equipment carried in vehicles which cross even this difficult country with comparative ease. Navigated by map and compass, the unit carries two surgeons, two anesthetists, one other medical officer, and 36 other ranks. It can go almost anywhere. The six-ton surgical truck has eight forward and two reverse gears, and all the other vehicles have double gearboxes. Within 45 minutes, the staff can have all these vehicles unloaded and the hospital ready for action. In 50 minutes, they can be off again with everything packed. One tent is for x-ray and blood transfusions, another for operations. Two others each hold 24 beds. The main tent is 45 feet long. Besides their hospital duties, the men continually practice loading and unloading. In Crete, according to reports, the enemy respected this signal to aircraft. So the presence of this camp is properly advertised. If the tents are bombed, there will be no excuse. However, they don't take too much risk. The trucks disperse just in case. Equipment for this unit was purchased in England through the first New Zealand General Hospital, and all of it was the latest procurable. As a result, the NZEF's first mobile surgical unit uses instruments which are probably the most modern in the Middle East. Only a practice patient is carried in this ambulance, but the unit regards his arrival at the desert station as a test of efficiency. When these pictures were taken, the unit had finished its training and was working under active service conditions. Perfection must be perfected. They must train and train some more. If the real thing does come along and the hot summer sun of Northern Africa is cooling now, it will be their task to see that New Zealand troops have the best of attention and only the best. Provision is made for all emergencies. Here, a blood transfusion is given. Perhaps the blood was donated by someone in this theater. Sooner than we expect, these instruments may be wanted for actual casualties. When that happens, the men will fight with all the greater determination, knowing that democracy recognizes their valor, the magnitude of their task, and gives them the support they deserve. Refreshed and refitted after the Balkan campaigns, this New Zealand Infantry Brigade is ready for inspection by Major General Freiburg, officer commanding the 2nd NZEF in the Middle East. Last to leave the beaches of Greece, this brigade since then has been completely re-equipped. Mention of their part in the rearguard action was made by General Freiburg when he addressed the parade. With interest, he had watched their subsequent training, he said, and now complimented them on their turnout. After this parade, the general with the brigadier took the salute at a march past. A display of trained manpower is not the general's only interest in his visit. Also on parade are armored vehicles that multiply the striking power of the infantry and with them the troop-carrying vehicles that speed the infantry's rate of travel from three miles an hour to 30. Footslogger is a term no longer fitting for the infantryman. With tanks in the spearhead, he comes close behind. Under the inspecting eye of the brigade commander, who stands at the saluting base with General Freiburg, the vehicles roll past. 
carriers for scouting and quick thrusts, trucks to bring motorized manpower into the gaps created by the armored divisions. From their strategic base in the Middle East, this one of many similar brigades is ready for instant movement. Like the All Blacks, they have weight and speed. When they do strike, they will strike hard.